introduce myself, my name is Dan Gilbard, and I'm a professor at BCC. Uh, I teach sociology, and I teach the race relations course here. I'm also the chair of the Multicultural Committee, which is sponsoring this event. And this is part of a uh, program that's going to be going on this spring and happens every semester with a variety of events, and they've already passed out the calendar to you. You can see some of the other events. Um, so I hope you'll choose to go to some of those as well. Um, today we're, we're going to be talking about one of the issues concerning racial inequality. Uh, what, why do we have so much economic inequality? Why are the poverty rates, for example, for black people in America or Latinos so much higher than for whites? And so I'll be discussing the different dimensions of economic inequality, be talking about some of the reasons and talking about some of the solutions. I'd like you to jot down uh, any questions you might have or any comments, and I'm going to stop this about 10 to 15 minutes before the end of the period, and then you can ask anything you want. Okay, so we'll have some discussion. Um, so, first of all, when we talk about inequality uh, and poverty, there's four different things that we could be talking about. One is poverty rates, which is the percentage of people that live in households which are below the poverty level. For example, a family of four, the poverty level is $22,000. So we'd have to be living in a household below that to be considered poor. I call that the extreme poverty level, but nevertheless, it tells you something if one group has a higher percentage or a lower percentage of poverty than another. Another thing we look at is family incomes or household incomes. What kind of incomes do families and households make and how do they vary from one race to the next? A third issue is earnings. What kind of money do people make on the job and are there differences in what people make between different races? And finally, differences in unemployment rates. And unemployment is the percentage of people that are actively seeking work but cannot find a job, even part-time. Uh, so it's basically a measure of the availability of jobs in the community. So taking a look at each of those, let's take poverty rates first. If you look at the bottom, that's the poverty rate, the most recent rates that we have available statistically. 2008, just before we hit the uh, economic recession that we're in right now. And as you see, the poverty rates for whites were 11%, which is actually pretty high compared to... Uh, but nevertheless, that's the poverty rate for whites. But if you look at the poverty rate for blacks, 24.7%, so it's twice as high. Latinos, almost as high. And Asians, about halfway in between. So you, there's vast differences in poverty rates, as you see in our society. This is something that's been true all the time, although you'll notice that the gap between white, whites and blacks has narrowed to some extent. And also Latinos are pretty much, blacks and Latinos are pretty much on the same par at this point. Okay. Uh, in terms of household incomes, uh, dramatic differences. The average, the average white family makes or white household, $52,312. Um, in black-headed households, 34218 And so you see the difference there. Again, if you look historically, that's been true right along, although there was some progress made between 1990 and 2000. Um, the next statistic has to do with earnings, and this is interesting because it's set up by education, and what you notice is that for every educational level, there's major differences in what people earn. This is for males. And so, for example, a male high school graduate who doesn't, hasn't gone to college, if they're whites, they make, on average, $33,805, blacks, $25,748. You see that whites are making more than each of these other groups for the same level of education, regardless of what level you're talking about. If you're white and you're male, you make more money with a high school diploma than blacks who, are make, who have some college education. That would be people, for example, that have attended community college or even have a community college degree. That's a sad statement because what you're saying, what that's saying is that there's more of an advantage to being white than there is to having some college and when it comes to produce, protect, and when it comes to determining the earnings that you make. Okay, and then finally, Unemployment rates, uh, again, vastly different. 2008, this is when the economy was going better. 2010, we're now in the middle of an economic recession. So the numbers are higher for every group. As you can see, generally speaking, twice as high for blacks as for whites. And Latinos are, again, somewhere in between. Um, 
So those are four dimensions of inequality that give you an idea of what we're talking about. Now, um, just keep in mind, though, that when we talk about, we're talking about large groups. And so there are individuals who are black who are well off, individuals that are Latino that are well off, and individuals that are white who are very poor. Just because you meet somebody from a particular group, you don't know what their economic status is. You know, in general, you're part of a group that, on average, might be better off and worse off than another. But individuals vary enormously, right? And there's much overlap between different groups. It's just a matter of degree. OK, so this is, but you're talking about something really important. You're talking about, do people have a job? We're talking about, what kind of income do people make? We're talking about um, what, whether people have enough to make ends meet. And there are really big differences based on races. And so, that, and there's consequences, as you know, in terms of the ability to get the things that we need in life. And so the question becomes, why is this going on? And then based on that, what could be done about it, right? So in terms of why it's going on, there's basically two explanations. Uh, and you hear these not so much within the sociology profession, although you do hear it to some extent within the profession, but you hear it more on the street. You hear it more on talk radio. Uh, you hear people saying, th for example, there are people that ascribe to what I call blaming the people explanations. Uh, there's also a book written by William Ryan entitled Blaming the Victim. And basically what he's saying is that groups that are disadvantaged in the society, instead of people looking at that and saying, what is it about the society that's causing that disadvantage, sometimes they look at the group itself and blame the group for its, its problems. So for example, in the case of this, it would be the most common statement you hear is people saying things like, well, my group did well, this group isn't, why don't they just do the same as us and work hard just like we did? The assumption is that some groups are working harder than others, that people that are successful are hard workers and people that aren't successful aren't hard workers. There's actually no evidence for that. If every group, most people work pretty hard to advance themselves. Uh, but nevertheless, that's something that's believed. Um, along with that, a lot of times people assume that there's a faulty family upbringing, that not, there's not enough emphasis on hard work. There's not enough teaching about the value system that people should have that people are going to look for the easy way out because they haven't been raised the correct way. Or perhaps families are more dysfunctional in some groups than others, and therefore people have more problems and are less able to be successful. Again, the problem with that is that if you look at families, families vary greatly in every group. There are some families that are very functional. There are some families that are not. Um, in every group, families push their ch children to, to, to advance as much as they can. If people are poor, they want their kids to be better off than they were. If people are well off, they want their kids to be just as well off as they were, if not better. Every family wants their kids to do well. Whether kids are able to do that or not is another story, but that's the aspirations that people have. The third, the third thing going to the bottom is a myth that goes back to the days of slavery, which is the assumption that people that don't do well in society, particularly minorities, are less intelligent than whites. And this is something that you don't hear too many people saying openly in this day and age. But there's a lot of evidence that it's still believed. It comes out in opinion polls where, where people are asked questions and, it, and it's pretty clear that they rank groups based on intelligence and also how hardworking they are. Um, but it also comes out, for example, in the publication of books. So for instance, The Bell Curve, which was produced in 1994, made the case that um, blacks were inferior to whites intellectually, substantially inferior. It even made the case that since blacks have less intelligence, that we shouldn't be thinking about them doing well in school, we should think about vocational alternatives that at least enable them to make a living and not to have to live in poverty. In the guise of being caring about black people, it was really saying this is a sem somewhat backward intellectually population, you know, so let's try to at least make the best of this bad situation. Um, the book itself is quite remarkable. It has lots of tables, lots of graphs. It looks very scientific. But when you analyze it, if you know statistical analysis, it's, it's bogus in a variety of ways. And also the references are very suspect because many of the references come from the 1920s and 1930s, and they come from people that espoused theories of racial superiority. In fact, a lot of the same authors that were cited by Adolf Hitler's folks when they were trying to justify the superiority of the Aryan race. This was a book that, now of course, books of all types come out all the time. But this was a book that was taken seriously as an academic work. If you walked into a bookstore, it was one of the prominent books that was displayed in the bookstores. 
It got book reviews in major publications like New York Review of Books. It got taken seriously. It was roundly criticized, I will say, but it was still taken as a legitimate explanation and alternative rather than a product of crackpots, right? It wasn't laughed out of the room. And I think the reason for that is a lot of people look at these persistent inequalities over time and they don't see the progress being made that they think they should, should be made. They figure, well, hey, we have the Civil Rights Act, we have laws that protect, we make progress in various ways, and yet these, these continue. Maybe there really is something to this idea that some groups are smarter than others. I think that's kicking around in a lot of people's brains. And so that's what we're contending with. We're contending with the continuation of prejudicial thinking that goes back again to the days of slavery. A more, a more accurate analysis, in my opinion, is one that looks at opportunity and looks at the unequal opportunities that do exist. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on today, is talking about the extent of unequal opportunity in two major areas. One is in the job market, that is the opportunity to get a job, and the other is in the educational system, which obviously has an impact on jobs, because if you're better educated, you're going to get better jobs than if you're worse educated. Okay? There's other issues as well that have to do with family, that have to do with the economy in the inner city, that have to do with the housing market, that have to do with criminal justice system. And if I had time, I could go through all of that, but realistically, I'm probably not going to be able to address any or much of that today. So let's look back at this table about earnings and education to start with. Um, the figures in this give pause. They begin, they lead you, if you look at them, to think that maybe there is a significant amount of discrimination going on. When you have one group that makes tens of, over $10,000 more than another at the same level of education, you have to wonder what's going on there. How does that come about? Because education, as we know, is probably the most important factor on an individual level in determining how much money we make, right? And so you would think that high school graduates, regardless of what group you are, would make fairly similar amounts of money on average. College graduates would make fairly similar amounts of money. But you, in fact, you have vast differences, as you see. Um, in the case of college graduates, you're talking about a, an advantage of about $13,000 because of being white versus being black, right? And if you're talking about high school graduates, it's a difference of about $8,000. That's pretty profound. And so perhaps what's going on is that people who get an education, yes, no matter what group you are, you get an advantage. But that advantage doesn't, is not the only thing that's going on. What also goes on is what race are you? And there's preference that goes on that helps certain races over others. So let's talk about some of the evidence that there is actually discrimination going on in the job market. Um, the most obvious evidence for that, in my opinion, has to do with who works in what jobs. If you look at a field where there should be some diversity, but where instead you have extreme differences in the, in the numbers of people that are enrolled in those particular fields based on race, you have to wonder. For instance, let's take the skilled trades. The skilled trades would be the best paid manual labor jobs. You don't need an education to be able to get those jobs. What you need is to be able to get into an apprenticeship program and a union and in order, in order to be able to work in the skilled construction trades. A carpenter, an electrician, a plumber, a steam fitter, an iron worker, a heavy construction operator, those kind of jobs, if you're working in a union, make really good money. And so whatever groups are, have access to those jobs are going to have a lot higher incomes than groups that don't. <coughs> Overwhelmingly, the skilled trades are white. They have been for a long time, and they still are. We have not seen major progress in that, in that regard. The only construction trade where you have major racial diversity is in laborers. And laborers are the lowest paid. It's not a skilled trade. Right? And so, so that, you know, I, I did a study, for instance, in Boston in the mid-90s for a job that I had, a research job. And I had access to information about people, that, males, who were working in different types of jobs and what kind of money they made. 
At that time, the average black male in Boston was making $9 an hour, and the average white, who had a college, just a high school diploma, the average white male was making 13. And when I looked at the difference between them in terms of occupations, what jumped out at me over and over and over again was that the white males that were making the better money, typically speaking, were working in the skilled trades. You just didn't see nearly as many examples of that when it came to black males, right? And so I think that's a really big factor and it helps to explain some of the difference. Um, another example of that would be when you walk into a restaurant. Um, I don't know how many of you guys go out to eat, but I, you know, I live in the Bedford area, and Bedford is pretty racially diverse, and there's a lot of women in the Bedford of all races that are qualified to be waitresses. They know serving, they have experience serving food, they do it in their families, they do it in all sorts of situations, and with the exception of those that don't perhaps speak English, they would all be candidates for being hired for uh, waitressing jobs. But the reality is that most of the restaurants in the Bedford, unless they're very ethnically focused, are mainly white women. You walk in and you see hostesses, you see waitresses, and they're mainly white. You don't see the diversity that you should be seeing if people had an equal opportunity to work in those kind of jobs. I had a student in my class uh, who got hired when one of the major restaurants in the greater New Bedford area uh, started, opened uh, about 15 years ago. And they initially hired 2,000 waitresses and put them through uh, a, a, a week-long training. Of the 200 that were hired, she said, this is a white woman in my class, that, that there were three women of color in the entire group out of 200, right? I mean, how did they manage to do that? I would assume that there was racial preference in the hiring process. The only other possibility was that minorities didn't apply, but why wouldn't you apply for a job that could be an improvement over what you have unless you're not being told about the job? I'm guessing that they did broad outreach, but that they picked and chose who they wanted because they had ingrained ideas about who they wanted to hire. Now, in the case of waitresses, why would they care? It could be one of two things. It could be stereotypes about who would be a good waitress, who, can, who would be competent. It takes a lot of intelligence to be a good waitress. Perhaps that's it. But I'm guessing more likely is catering to the customers. They think that some of the customers are, who are predominantly white and predominantly older may not want to be served by a person of color. Um, and they pay attention to customers. They do it with women too in terms of who they hire. Why do they hire younger, pr very pretty women for those kind of jobs? You know, they're catering to the customers and who's paying the bills in that case, right? So I think they do the same thing in terms of the hiring. In any case, you, there's no question that, that uh, minorities are heavily underrepresented in, those, in, that, in that type of job. Another example is in the sports world. Um, I follow sports very closely. In football, which is an example of a sport where blacks particularly have thrived and have dominated, really, in terms of who are the players in college football and in, in pro football, those are the, you would expect to see a lot of black head coaches. Now, in the, in the pro football ranks, you're beginning to see that. It's still under representation, but there's considerable progress that has been made. Um, but in the ranks of college football, still between three to five Division I schools in any given year have black head coaches out of 119. Now, th that just doesn't make sense. I mean, if you have, if you think about who are the pool from which head coaches would come, it would tend to be people that played the sport. You learn the sport by playing it initially, then you have the talent also to coach it, right? But in the case of college athletics, you're not seeing that at the level of head coach. Um, and so that gives an idea of, even in the sports world, how there are particular occupations that are where minorities are heavily underrepresented. You also see it in the ranks of management. Um, I, um, at lower management level, for example, uh, one of the studies that uh, I looked at was a book by a, uh, about a company which was labeled ProMac, which you see listed on the, on the screen. And ProMac was a name that they made up, but in this particular place, it was, it was in a community which was south of Chicago, just south of the border, which is a very heavily black area, and where the population in this community was about 75% black. It turned out that the people that were working in this place the blacks that worked in the place tended to have a higher education than the whites because the whites had better alternatives than working in that factory, but the blacks didn't, so they tended to work in, in the factory. Out of the foremen, there were 45 foremen. 40 of the foremen were white and five were black. 
And yet, the, the workers themselves, from which the foreman came, were more, the, bl the blacks were more educated than the whites. So obviously they weren't using education qualifications for deciding who was going to be boss, right? Now, um, so that's an example at the lower level of management. At the higher level of management, you have chief executive officers of large corporations. And there, then the percentage of blacks who are chief ex executive officers are far less than 1%. Women, by the way, face similar issues. Women are something like 3% of chief executive officers, and yet they're half the population, right? A lot of this occupational stuff, by the way, you can say very similar things about women as you can say about minorities. It's the under-representation that you're talking about. Women, for example, full-time full -time employed women make, on average, 76 cents on every dollar that ma males make. Similar to the statistic we just saw about people of equal education making about 80% of, uh, depending, on, depending on what race they are. Okay, some of the other information here, uh, testing studies that have been done. Now, testing studies are where you send out two individuals or paired individuals. So one person is white, one person is black, and they go to different employers and they say, they, pu they put in applications, right? And in some cases, they get an interview, and in some cases, they don't. In some cases, they're, they're told, we're not hiring, I'm not even going to take an application, and in some cases, they're told they're hiring. And th so the blacks and the whites that apply are, generally speaking, the similar age. They present themselves nicely. They dress the same. They have similar qualifications, like educationally and so on. So they're matched in a way that they should be getting fairly similar responses. And yet what happens is that, that, that whites get many more interviews and, get many more, and, and have many more of their applications accepted. And one particular testing study that, that really struck me was one where they added an additional complication. What they did is they said that's, that half of the time that when the black person applied, he said that he had a criminal record. And you know, employers will ask questions like, do you have prior criminal record, right? So half the time they would say yes, half the time they would say no. Half the time the, black per the white person applied the same thing. Half the time they would say yes, sometimes they would say no. And so you had four different situations. You had blacks with criminal records, blacks without criminal records, whites with criminal records, and whites without. Do you know that the black men without criminal records were less likely to get an interview than the white men with a criminal record? Right? They were more interested in the person being white than they are with the person not having a criminal record. They were more concerned about the person being black than they were with that the person might have a criminal record. I think that's pretty amazing because I can understand, I'm more, it's very obvious to me that an employer would be influenced by the idea that someone had a criminal record. They'd want to know that the person had turned over a new leaf, that they were doing, leading a different kind of life than they had in the past. But when you, in terms of your race, you don't know anything about that person when they come before you. And yet the assumption is that there's something about being black that's bad enough that we should rate that as more serious concern in, when it comes to hiring than having a criminal record. Um, a couple of other things in studies that have been done of employer attitudes, where they've interviewed employers and done fi to find out what their perceptions are. And what they've found is that a lot of employers basically say that they think that blacks are, or Latinos are a group that isn't as hardworking or is not, uh, doesn't learn as well on the job or so on and so forth as, as whites do. And based on that, they will in oftentimes pr pr prefer to hire whites over blacks in their hiring. They don't feel they're discriminating. They feel that they're taking the most qualified people. So what is it, what is the reality here? And let's take a look, for example, at the issue of, of absenteeism or quitting, which is one way of measuring whether someone's lazy. If someone's lazy, they're going to tend to be absent more from the job. They're also probably going to quit their jobs more often because they're sick of working because they don't like work, right? If people are hardworking, they're going to have lower absentee rates and they're going to have lower quit rates. Now, when you compare blacks and whites, what do you find? What you find is that for the similar types of jobs, right, that the quit rates are no higher for blacks and absenteeism rates are no higher for blacks. And in fact, they're slightly higher for whites. And that's logically speaking, that would make sense. It's not because whites are lazy and don't want to work. It's because if you have more alternatives, then you're more likely to feel that you can get away, you can be absent because if they do fire you, you'll find something else, right? 
And in terms of quitting, you feel again that you have more options. But if you feel like this is all that you can get, you're going to be more careful about how you behave because you want to make sure to hold on. It might be a lousy job, but it's still your job, right? So there's no real evidence that, um, that there are differences in things like hardworkingness and laziness. But the reality is that employers do perceive it that way. Why do they perceive it? Because they've been taught, like everyone else in the society, that they've been taught stereotypes. They've been taught generalizations about groups. The generalization, historically, and it comes down from the day of slavery, is that non-white peoples are not as hardworking as whites. Right? And based on that, you're less likely to want to hire them. They've been taught that non-white people are not as intelligent. And based on that, you, would, might, you might not choose to hire them as well. You've been taught that, that non-white people are more criminally inclined, and therefore you might think that a person would be more likely to steal on the job. Well, there's no evidence for that either. Uh, there are a lot of workers that pilfer on the job, but all groups do it. There's no limitation, no limit to one group versus another. Um, so employers are influenced by their stereotypes. And one of the things about stereotypes that you study in social psychology is that once you have a belief about somebody and then it seems like evidence could always fit in to seem to conform the stereotype. Because there's always examples of people that are lazy or, don't, or appear not to be hardworking, appear not to take the job seriously. And all you need is a few examples to maintain your original assumption. On the other hand, if there's a group that acts in a way that's contrary to the stereotype, our tendency is to dismiss it as, well, that's, that's just a, you know, an exceptional case. That's not typical. And so we have a, very, we have a tendency, once we have a stereotype, to, can t to continue to believe it in the f based on there's enough evidence in the real world that kind of fits the stereotype that we just continue on to hold on to it. So employers, obviously, if they hold those stereotypes, are going to tend to discriminate. Now, there's one other piece to this that needs to, needs to be talked about, which is some of it has to do not with racial preference in the sense of I don't want minorities in, I want whites in, but more just with taking care of your own. In the case of the skilled trades, a lot of what's going on is that, is that people are getting hired because they're the sons or the nephews or the younger brothers of people that are already working, right? They're the ones that are going to get the preference. And you can understand that. Everybody's going to try to take care of their own. That's not a racially driven thing. That's just something that people do because they're trying to help out their relatives and their, and, or their friends, right? But the end result is that whatever group is dominant to begin with, that tends to be perpetuated because who have those connections, they tend to be able to get it. So as long as you're passing out favors based on family or even based on friendship connections, you know, whatever group dominates in the beginning is going to continue to dominate in terms of future hiring. So it's hard to break through that because you've got a situation where a lot of hiring is based on connections and who you know and family and things of that nature. Okay, so those are all pieces of evidence that to me point pretty overwhelmingly to the concept that there is unequal opportunity on the job. And I would want to add some, one, only one other thing to this, which is part of that unequal opportunity on the job has to do with where people live. Now, let, I'm going to give an example of this that doesn't have anything to do with race, but it illustrates it. If you live in the Bedford area or the Fall River area, as most people here do, you're living in an area where the unemployment rate is higher than average. You're living in an area where the poverty rates are higher than average. You're living in a disadvantaged economic area compared to much of the rest of the state. We're always ranked in the top two or three cities on those kind of statistics, right? So we could have people that would be the hardest working people on the face of the earth, but the bottom line is there's not enough jobs to go around. And the bottom line is that the wage level for the jobs that do exist is pretty bad, right? Now that, that's true. It's also true that generally speaking, the inner city ghettos of America, the areas where minorities are concentrated and tend to live, are economically going down the tubes and have been for a long time. If you go back to World War II, after World War II, most black people in America lived in the South. They then migrated in heavy numbers to the North between, between and North could include the Midwest, like Chicago, or a place like Boston, or New York, right? Um, they moved North in large numbers between 1945 and 1970. That was called the Great Migration. It was a tremendous transformation. And people were going from, the peop and people at that time, young, the men that came, could oftentimes get jobs in factories making relatively decent money, above minimum wage, making a living for their families. They did not have to have an education. All they want, needed to do was to be able to work hard. 
And if you're talking about people that have worked on cotton plantations and now came to work in factories, they were used to working hard, right? So people could get jobs, for example, in Detroit working in the auto factories, in Chicago working in the steel mills, in Los Angeles working in the aerospace industry. In New York, Puerto Rican men could get jobs working in, in um, the garment industry, the needle trades. All those manufacturing trades went down. They either moved out of the city or moved out of the country. And so what you had was thriving manufacturing centers that became ghost towns, where you just had all these, and, and we know that from our area, what that's like, because we've had a lot of mills that have shut down here. It's the same kind of thing. And so you had a lot of jobs that previously less educated males could get that now no longer existed. So the only way to cope with that would have been to be able to live outside of the city, because outside of the city there were still more jobs, right? There was fewer jobs being shut down. In some cases there were expansion. For example, in, in the Boston area, manufacturing in the city declined, but you had the rise of the computer industry and a lot of manufacturing and janitorial and other kind of jobs out in that area. But the people that live in that area are mainly white, because it's difficult to live in the suburbs if you're a person of color. There's a lot of discrimination that goes on, both in rental housing and in sales of housing. So people tend to live in the inner city ghetto because that's what's available to them, but now you're living in a depressed economic area, right? So a lot of that, a lot of, a lot of the issue also has to do with having less opportunity because of where people live. Okay, so that's the job piece. Now the second part that I want to focus on today has to do with education. And this is something where we could spend an entire class and more talking, but I'm going to give you the 15 minute version, so to speak. Um, education obviously has a big effect. Now as we saw before, it's not the only thing that determines it. You could still be educated and not get much as someone else because of things like race. But the bottom line is, if you had equal educational levels, then the poverty rates for minorities would be much lower than what they are and the incomes would be much higher. And so the question is, why do you have such a major gap in education? Now when I say major gap in education, let's be clear on what the gap is and isn't. Um, in terms of high school, the dropout rate is particularly high for Latinos. It is a little bit higher for blacks and a little bit lower for whites. There's not as much of a gap when it comes to blacks and whites, but between uh, whites and blacks on the one hand, Latinos on the other, there's a significant gap. Part of the reason for that is a lot of Latinos are first generation. And so you have people coming from poorly educated homes that haven't had an opportunity to build up their education. Another reason that blacks have been able to bridge the gap is because there's a lot of push in the black community to succeed educationally. People have known for a long time that if you can't make it through education, you stand no chance. And so to some extent, the gap has been bridged when it comes to dropout rates, to some extent. Um, but in terms of college education, it's still a vast difference. Uh, the, the likelihood of a white person uh, graduating, a young white person graduating from college is about twice as high as for a black person or a Latino. And college degrees are critical when it comes to, when it comes to determining the income of a family. Um, I'm assuming that's probably why you guys are here. <laughs> you want to get that college degree, you recognize that that's necessary. It's true for any group. And so, why is there such a difference then in the rate of college degrees and for some groups at least, the rate of high school uh, dropouts? Okay, so the first issue I wanna talk about is unequal funding. Uh, there are schools in this country that are funded at a level that it's difficult to believe if you don't experience it. I haven't experienced it directly myself, but I've read a book called Savage Inequalities by Jonathan Kozol. And Jonathan Kozol is an educational journalist who interviewed people in different communities about a range of educational issues. And he, in his book, Savage Inequalities, he identifies six cities that are particularly extreme when it comes to lack of funding. Okay, one of them is New York City, another one is Chicago, another one was Camden, New Jersey, which, which is right over the line from Pennsylvania, from Philadelphia. Um, and one of them was East St. Louis, which is just outside of St. Louis, it's in Illinois. And there were two others as well that I can't remember with the name of the towns. And in each of these, he describes in excruciating detail the extreme inequality, what he calls the savage inequalities that the kids, who are almost all kids of color, are experiencing in these communities. 
For example, in East St. Louis, the school was so bad physically that you had sewage backup coming into the school. Okay? You had the, the locker room, the visiting locker room for the teams that played sports was so bad that teams would come in, play a game, and instead of, instead of showering and changing there, they would go back on their bus, travel an hour in their sweaty clothes so that they could take a shower in their own, in, in their own places. Uh, they had no field goals, field goal posts on the football, in the football field. They had no functioning science labs. The teachers paid for the supplies out of their own pockets. That's how underfunded East St. Louis is. Um, the second example was Chicago, and one of the issues they talked about in Chicago was the issue of teachers. When you're in wealthy communities, or even average communities, almost every child has a regular teacher all day long. When you're in poorer communities and schools like this, that's the exception. You have some regular teachers, but a lot of the teachers are permanent subs. Sometimes they're not even permanent subs, but they're just intermittent subs, different people at different times. And what happened in Chicago, though, often was that you'd go to class and there would be no sub at all. And you would actually go to the gym, and five or six other classes would too, and you would sit there in the gymnasium all day with 150, 200 students, with the gym teacher standing in front saying, listen guys, I can't do any teaching in this, but it, just try to keep it down and be quiet and you can listen to your whatever and do your thing, just don't make, create an uproar and we'll all make the best of a bad situation. And that was called education. Right? That's Chicago, Illinois, the second biggest city in the, the country. And that's what's going on in some of those schools. Now, in, in, on the other extreme, you have schools that are very well funded. You have schools that are better, better funded than anything that people around here have experienced. Right? Places like Wellesley or Newton or Brookline or Weston, well-to-do communities that have, are made up of professional people that work in higher level professions, doctors and lawyers and, and others that make, you know, whose fam where the family incomes are 100,000 over dollars a year or more consistently, those kind of communities oftentimes put large amounts of money into the school system. They have the economic base to do it, right? Their local property taxes are such, because their houses are valued so much, that they can tax them and put that money to create education that's far superior than anything you would find even in the average school, let alone in these really awful schools, right? Um, your class sizes are going to be low. Uh, your educational resources are going to be to the max in terms of videos, in terms of all sorts of educational technology. They, some of them have multiple Olympic-sized swimming pools. I mean, these are incredible public schools that are basically prep schools for the Ivy League, okay? Mo many of the kids going to these schools end up getting into the best colleges in the country not just because their parents have money, but because they do well in education. But why do they do well? Because the quality of the schooling they're getting is so good. They are getting college, they're truly being prepared for college. They are getting college level work, in some cases as early as ninth grade, right? Um, so these are the, that's the other extreme. Now there are a lot of, you know, if you talk about the average white person, most of us don't go to schools like that either. Most of us go to schools that are kind of in between. They're not the East St. Louis type of school, but they're not the Wellesley either. They're in the, in the middle. But, you know, so there's inequalities that exist that, don't, that transcend race. Some of it has to do with race. A lot of it has to do with economics, okay? But the bottom line is that the very worst schools in terms of funding in the country are schools that are not only poor, but are largely racial minority schools. Poor whites tend to live all over. They're more likely to live outside the city in the suburbs, more likely to live in a neighborhood where the neighborhood school is better. The schools that are the worst are the mainly ghetto areas where mostly people are living are racial minorities. Okay, so that's the first issue is funding. The second issue has to do with what happens in the school itself. And you can, be in the, you can even be in a school that's fairly modern. That doesn't mean that everybody gets treated the same in that school. First of all, there's a, there's a policy that most schools follow, which is called ability grouping. In the elementary school, you break kids up in kindergarten or in the first grade into different groups, and then you treat them differently. For example, one study of ability grouping in St. Louis, Missouri, um, the teacher divided their students up in the eighth, on the eighth day of class into table A, B, and C. Table A was considered high ability, C was low ability, and B was in between. 
In the eighth day of class, she thought she knew enough about these students to break, that, break, the, break the students up in that way. She proceeded to teach the kids very differently. The kids in table A got much more attention from her. They got more eye contact. They got more praise. She would write on the side of the blackboard near where they sat, because they would sit in the tables. She would meet with them individually. Five, six of her teaching individual group work that she did was with table A. Only one sixth with table B and C combined. Even show and tell to say what you did on Halloween was reserved mainly for the table A kids. She didn't think the table B and C kids deserved it. Okay? This teacher was well regarded in her school because she did a good job teaching the kids that were considered to be teachable, right? As long as she did that, she was considered a success. The fact that some of her kids were being held back or basically not learning very much at all and were increasingly disadvantaged as, you know, throughout the year, that didn't matter because those kids were assumed not to be teachable anyway. There was a labeling process that went on, right? So that's the kind of thing that can go on in a school. I'm not saying, by the way, that every single time you have these levels that, that, that is done. Sometimes teachers will, will work really hard with the lower group to help bring them up to speed. But oftentimes it becomes a label that, that equals low potential, I can't reach them, I'm going to focus mainly on the smarter kids or the kids that have more of what it takes. Um, a second um, piece of this is when people get to the sixth grade, they then take a test called the Iowa Test of Basic Achievement. And that, t that basically is a ticket into the seventh grade. If you score well on that test, you go into whatever the level is that's the highest or the higher levels in the seventh grade. You take classes with kids in that level. All of you rem must remember that, that once you hit the junior middle school and afterwards, generally speaking, you, you have different levels that they set up, right? If you score poorly on that test, you generally go into the lower level. And what the levels are depend tremendously on, differently from the year to year in particular schools. But generally speaking, there are levels with kids that are clearly being prepped for college and some that are even more advanced placement work. And then you have kids that are being prepped for nothing. And you have remedial classes. So you have levels of treatment. And the studies that have been done of that indicate that teachers that are teaching in the lower level are typically far less enthusiastic, that they challenge their kids left, less, that they give more assignments of the nature of, okay, here's a workbook assignment, do your work and I'll read the newspaper or do whatever I want to do meanwhile and not actually teach you, right? Um, they're less likely to be able to have, have paperbacks, they're less likely, instead of just plain old textbooks. Um, they just get treated in a less, with low expectations. And so being in the lower level is pretty much a recipe for school failure and much less likely that a person like that is gonna acquire the skills that ultimately will enable them to go to college and be successful in college. Another piece of this has to do with discipline. Uh, the rate of discipline does, of disciplining people for, for various kinds of infractions varies from group to group. One of the things that goes on in a lot of schools right now is a very high rate of suspensions, out of school suspensions, for basically attitude issues. I mean, it's one thing when a kid uses violence, if it brings a gun to class, deals drugs in the school, things of that nature, but you're talking a lot of times about having, quote, an attitude, right? Some of which is just goes with the territory of the age, some of which sometimes is a response to the humiliation that people feel in the school because they're being treated like dummies. But in any case, the suspension rate is considerably higher for black and Latino kids than it is for white kids. And this has a very negative effect ultimately on things like dropping out and on how much people learn because people are out of school. They're not, they're not doing their schoolwork while they're suspended. And in fact, it puts, them in a, it puts them in a disadvantage and it makes them feel alienated from school. So I think that this whole suspension system aggravates the problem considerably. Another issue is unequal family resources. Now this could, this could, this is really a class issue. This has to do with how much income your family has. So there's a connection between class and race, but it's not strictly a race issue, it's more a class issue. If you come from a family which is better educated and which makes more money because the parents work in professional types of jobs, you're probably going to have a computer in the home. You're probably going to have a nice, fast internet connection. You're probably going to have done some traveling and have visited places that you read about in your history courses, right? 
you're probably going to have access to a tutor if you have any problem, and not just the tutor they supply in the school, but a private tutor, right? 25 bucks an hour or whatever, that's okay. It's a no nothing is too important for my kid, right? You're probably going to have gone to an SAT prep class to prep you on how to get the best possible scores in the SAT so that you can get that extra boost and get into that better college, right? You've got a lot of things going for you. You're also exposed to parents who, first of all, have a larger vocabulary because they are better educated, and secondly, um, that are more likely to understand how the academic system works and therefore to provide more assistance to your kids. Less educated parents typically want their kids to succeed, but they don't understand very much about how that happens. And so, so the kids basically can, can give the impression that they're doing what needs to be done. They show up at school, you know, they, you go back to back to school night and the teachers say, oh, Johnny's very nice. But they're getting C's, they're skating by, they're not working very hard, they're blowing off a lot of their homework, right? And they're not getting much anyway, by the way, in terms of their homework, because less is expected of them, right? And the parents don't know the difference. So, so you know, and parents a lot of times, if you're poorly educated, are excited that their kids are going to graduate from high school. Yeah, that's good. But in this day and age, we're talking about college graduation being the bottom line, not high school graduation, right? And so it is an advantage to have more educated parents. It's not because the less educated parents don't care. It's simply they don't know as much, right? They don't have the resources. High stakes testing, this is just another problem. The MCAS in particular in this state. You've got people that are flunking the MCAS because they've had an inferior education. If you're in a more poorly funded school where the class sizes are less, where you don't have regular teachers, where you're in the lower ability grouping, where you have uh, where you're in the lower levels, your chance of learning the stuff that you need to know in order to be able to pass MCAS are a heck of a lot less than somebody else, right? And so, and if you look at the statistics, racial minorities are overrepresented in the ranks of those who do not pass MCAS and therefore do not get a, a high school diploma. Development of an anti-school culture. Uh, what this refers to is what in, it becomes a vicious circle. If you treat kids with disrespect, if you make kids feel stupid because they feel like they don't, they don't understand these things, they aren't learning what the way they need to learn, kids start to hate school. And what happens is that school becomes a place where you hang around with your friends, where you, where you do various antics to try to prove how cool you are. Maybe you do a little rebellion against the teachers of the school, but you don't apply yourself, you basically disengage. People that are pro, are interested in school, and we can relate to this with BCC, are people that have who feel like they feel that the school is working for them and they can understand the reason why they're there and they can see that if they put some effort in they're going to get some result, right? And so what you get is the kids develop an, a culture that's anti-school and where your peers almost make fun of you if you work hard because what the hell are you doing? You're some kind of sucker playing that game, you know, that's a bunch of crap basically. And so you end up, um, it ends up being reinforced then by your own peers. It can change because the school, if the school is set up in a more positive way, you could have a positive peer culture that would reinforce more positive behavior, but that's not going to be the case if kids are treat, being treated in a negative fashion. The self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of it. How many of you have heard of the self-fulfilling prophecy? You have, okay. So basically what this says is that and this applies to many different fields, but as applied to education, what it says is that if the teachers and the schools in general have a higher expectation for students, that students will tend to succeed more. And if they love lower expectations, that students will tend to succeed less. Um, higher expectations leads to teachers and the school devoting more resources, working harder, giving them more confidence, and giving them more opportunity to succeed. Based on that, they end up doing better. It reinforces the original positive expectation. The negative goes the same way in the reverse, right? You have less resources, less confidence, neg more negative treatment, and therefore less production, and in the end, it reinforces the negative expectation, right? Now, let me give you an example of a study that was done. This is a classic study that was done uh, by a sociologist named Rosenthal. And he went into the, into the San Francisco public schools and went into first grade classrooms, and he administered a test. And he claimed that the test was for the purpose of determining which students were what he called bloomers, basically a student that maybe hadn't demonstrated up to them a lot, but they had potential, right? The reality was that the test he, measured, he administered, he threw the results out, 
in the wastebasket. He didn't care about the test. He just was trying to make the impression that he was doing a scientific study. He then at random identified five students in every class who he called bloomers. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Picked, chose them by ran at random. And he told the teachers the results. Oh, by the way, I just want to tell you that study I did, here are the five people that came out as bloomers in your class. And then he watched what happened. Well, guess what? The bloomers bloomed, right? Those kids ended up doing better than their peers in terms of grades, doing b gaining in their IQ scores. They actually acted, uh, tested smarter when they were given IQ tests than they had previously. They were given an IQ test the before and then after. Um, they were more likely to, to be rated by their, by their fellow students as somebody you would like to be friends with, because I'm assuming that those kids felt better about themselves and therefore re interacted more positively with other kids, right? That was the result. These kids were chosen at random. The only thing that happened was that the teacher had their expectations artificially manipulated by this phony information that was given to them, right? And so they treated them better and they responded, right? The same thing, by the way, has happened with, in studies with adults. We as adults respond that way too, right? Um, it depends on, the pe on your teachers. It depends on the people, the authority figures that you interact with, how well you do. It doesn't only depend on that, but that's a major factor that influences how well we do, right? So that's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that's in general speaking, I think, what's going on here. Um, the final point, success stories. Um, one of the evidence pieces of evidence that, that, these are, that this analysis is correct is that there are schools which have overcome some of the inequalities that exist. And I'm just going to give one example that you may be familiar with. It's a movie that came out a few years ago called Stand and Deliver. It's about a Mexican-American community in Los Angeles. Uh, the teacher named Jaime Escalante is pay, played by Edward James Olmos. Uh, and he goes into this school. Um, and they, they show, it's a fictionalized but true account of what happens. He goes in as a math teacher, he's teaching basic math. The kids in that school are going nowhere fast. The dropout rate is high, the, they're disengaged in school. A lot of the girls are going to be getting pregnant before they f finish high school. A lot of the guys are getting involved with gangs. Right? He takes this group of kids and works with them and gets them to the point where they get serious about math. And he takes them through all the steps. Basic math, Algebra, uh, second year algebra, pre-calculus, trigonometry, and calculus. He, he does more than a year's worth. He, has, he teaches them over the summer. He teaches them on Saturdays. They stay late after school. Um, he plugs away and plugs away, and so a number of these kids really get excited about learning. They start to feel smart. They start to feel motivated. The, the gang member drops out of the gang. You know, the girls start to think of themselves as having a brain and not just being pretty and possible partners with some, some guy. And in the end, they take the advanced placement exam, and lo and behold, they pass with scores four and five, which is like an A or a B in a college calculus class, right? The educational testing service that administers the test accuses them of cheating. They have to retake the test. They retake it, and again, they get fours and fives. And this was the beginning of the development of a math dynasty at that high school. That high school got to the point where they had, a, at their peak, 187 kids in one year passing the advanced placement exam of calculus. You know how you have schools that are football powerhouses or basketball powerhouses, and, then, and they're in the inner city, they have a lot of black kids playing for them and Latinos, and you say, yeah, well, you know how those kids are. They're really good in sports. They care about sports, right? We expect that, but we don't expect a math powerhouse in the middle of the ghetto. But this was a math powerhouse. I went to a good high school myself in California, too. And uh, our high school had 15 kids that passed the advanced placement exam in, in, in uh, calculus. We had a school that was about half the size of that other school. So it's the equivalent of 30. So we had the equivalent of 30. They had 187, right? What had happened, obviously, was that the teacher who was so successful inspired not only the kids, but he inspired a lot of the other teachers who said, wait a second, if he can do it, maybe there's some, these kids do have potential after all. And teachers volunteered to participate, and teachers from throughout the system were interested in coming in, and they started teaching these kids. And they ended up having an inspired math program. Now, you can't do that with every, every school, but the pro point is that it showed 
that kids that have been labeled as dummies, as less than, as uninterested, could become engaged and could perform at a level beyond which most of us don't think we can perform. If you did a survey at BCC and said to people, how many of you think you can get an A or B in a college calculus class if they, we give you enough training, I would guess you'd probably get 10% of the people saying yes, right? We've all tend to believe that, you know, whatever difficulties we have in math is just because we don't have what it takes. But the bottom line is, most people have what it takes if you have the expectation that they do and you work within a patient and, and consistent manner. Okay, so the two points here, one is that job market opportunities are unequal, and the second is that educational opportunities are unequal. Finishing up. So what needs to be done? Um, what needs to be done is the government, which can implement changes, needs to intervene to make sure that educational and job opportunity are more equal. There's a lot of things you could do for that. First of all, educationally speaking, we need to have adequate funding for education in all communities. Secondly, in terms of jobs, we need to be investing in the inner city. We need to be providing jobs that are government funded to provide for the needs of people. People need to be hired in areas as diverse as daycare, as housing uh, rehab people, uh, people that would build parks, would maintain and, and repair roads, uh, people that can provide services of all kinds. Um, there are needs in inner cities that are not being met. You have unemployed people. You can hire those people to do those things. We don't just have those needs in the inner city. We have those needs in the broader society. We need to be able to do that as well. But there has to be a particular investment in the inner city because there's so little economic opportunity that exists there. So those are two changes that we could advocate for. We could get involved in trying to make sure that we had a government that did that. We can do that by becoming informed voters. We can do that by organizing other people to advocate for changes that are positive. What is our own responsibility in this? I think the first responsibility is in our day-to-day -day behavior that we are conscious of what's around us and we work hard to make sure that we show respect for all the people that are around us. For example, some people might be going on to become teachers. Obviously, having high expectations for all students is a critical factor, right? Some of us might be bosses, be supervising others. Having a high expectations for others makes a difference there as well. The second thing is we need to be able to intervene at a political level to make sure that the government that we have cares about these issues. Frankly, the issue of racial inequality is on the back burner in this country. The trend has been to disinvest from the inner city rather than to invest. The trend is to cut social programs. That has a particularly negative effect on people who are minorities. It also has a negative effect on many who are white because anybody in the lower three quarters of the economic ladder needs to be benefits from public programs, public schools, right, um, daycare systems, healthcare, you name it. The help that we get from, from the government is proportional to the needs that we have. And so basically we need to make sure that we get involved politically to influence government to do the right thing. And we have the, in, the power to do that. As individuals, our power is limited. But what we have is the numbers. So if large numbers of people work together trying to influence government, we can make that happen. So thank you very much. Thank you for that rousing applause. And now um, I'd like to have a little discussion and I'd love to have questions uh, or, and I will repeat any of the questions just so the, uh, the video picks up well, what people have to say. What questions do you have? Yes. As, as far as what? I'm sorry, grouping. Um, I forget exactly what we call it. Right. 
Well, I think the problem is that most kids, let, let's take the example of, the sta of that Stand and Deliver movie, right? Those were kids that are almost all at the lower level, and yet they were, well, they all were, they, they were at the lower level. They were taking basic math in the ninth grade. They weren't even at algebra, right? And yet, once they had an inspired teacher, they were able to succeed. And so the assumption behind mixing kids together and not to have those groupings is that if you have a teacher that has high expectations, that you could reach most of the students. And you can create a culture in that classroom that brings everybody up. So you don't have to bring people down, you can bring people up. I'm gonna give an example of that here, right? I mean, I teach sociology. I don't take my A students and put them in one group and my B students and put them in a second group and my C, D, and E stu F students in a third group, right? I mix everybody together. And, and, I'm not, and, I, and I don't dumb it down. I teach the same way as if I was teaching all day students, but I do it in a way, hopefully, that shows a real interest in students, that is clear, that is motivating, and I give people ways of succeeding, right? And so hopefully I end up connecting to some extent with those kids at all levels without hurting the most talented students. So I think mixing people together ends up working for everybody. It particularly helps the kids that otherwise would be negatively labeled at the lower levels, but it doesn't necessarily hurt the kids at the higher levels because you're still teaching um, a, a, a serious piece. You're not dumbing down your course. You're still teaching a college course's worth or in the case of high school, a high school course's worth. That's a good question though. Uh, do other people have questions? Anybody have any comments? Okay, I want to thank you for coming and uh, appreciate the attention and the, the head nodding and all, and I'll see you folks in the future. Bye-bye.